This is the Good Neighbor Podcast, the place where local businesses and neighbors come together. Here's your host, Jeremy Wolf. Hello, hello, everyone, and welcome to the Good Neighbor Podcast. I'm your host, Jeremy Wolf, and my guest today, an interesting one today, he began government service with Senator Patrick Monaghan and continued his work um, in the U.S. State Department of State's Human Rights Bureau, then went on to work in the White House for three years, where he served as the aide to the De- Deputy National Security Advisor, then went on to become a counterterrorism officer for the CIA, and later worked for the government in multiple overseas posts, earning several commendations for meritorious service. Uh, in 2008, he opened Crossroads Investigations to subcontract for retired CIA chiefs of station with corporate due diligence contracts, Crossroads has since expanded into a full service private investigative for a private investigation and due diligence firm named by the Daily Business Review as the top private investigation agency in South Florida. Today we have Mark Hurwitz. Thank you, sir, for joining us. Thank you so much for having me, Jeremy. Yeah, it's our pleasure. Excited to get into this. So why don't we start from the present? Tell us a little bit about Crossroad in Crossroads Investigations, what you guys do, and then we shall proceed from there. Yeah, so we're based in Miami, but we're statewide. We can actually do uh, international, global work. We do everything from surveillance for insurance fraud, for infidelity. We find assets, bank accounts, find people, um, do background reports, employment screening, jury vetting, um, any hard to find information, public records all over the country, um, anything any hard to find information, that's what we do. Right on. So 2008, you started this business. What, what was it? What was the impetus that got you out of public service into the private sphere? Yeah, I was, I was here in uh, Florida and I decided to stay and, and not go back overseas with, uh, with CIA. So I went up on, on my own, ventured on my own, started uh, networking. Uh, working with my old bosses, as you said, I started networking in South Florida. Uh, lawyers started asking me for information. I finally admitted I'm a private investigator, got all my licenses. Um, yeah, but it really, I did uh, network nonstop, and I still do, but I have people who, uh, who help me do that now uh, as we've grown. Uh, but we've, we've just uh, we've really exploded since then. There's not that many private investigation agencies um, in Florida. And uh, certainly none that work as closely with uh, the legal and business communities like we do. And it's just grown steadily over the years. I think people have a preconceived notion of what a private investigator is. They think of like a private dick from from shows of the past where you go out on all these fancy missions and you uh, can you maybe quell some of the myths or misconceptions or address some of those things like I know you, you guys do. You started with corporate due diligence contracts. Yeah. So we still um, do a lot of it. Talk a little bit about that so uh, yeah, have a better understanding. I, I certainly understand why people think that. And uh, to be fair, of the 7,000 licensed investigators in Florida, probably 98% of them are one-off uh, retired former law enforcement officers who are doing surveillance in the field, following people around. Um, and we certainly do that too. But what we do is, is a whole different level. We, we certainly do a lot of due diligence research. We have a former CIA analyst uh, who works on our staff, and she'll put together these, these really thoughtful, huge papers on how maybe how are two businesses related, a reputation of a person, political opposition research, um, um, looking into uh, the background of a witness, of the opposing party in a court case. So we do a lot of writing and research. And in fact, even our field investigations start with an online research uh, project by our case managers, our in-house case managers. Um, You cannot really do an effective investigation in the field following anybody if you are not first looking up that person online, checking their social media, looking for their habits, where they like to go, uh, looking um, at their criminal records, are they a dangerous person? Um, all of these things go into a well thought out field investigation. We're doing map planning. Can we get into the neighborhood? Are there multiple ways in and out of the neighborhood? Um, so, and I should add, when we have people out in the field, we're supporting them. We're running license plate numbers. We're looking at maps real time. Uh, we're communicating with the clients real time. 
uh, it's a whole different level from from a, a guy in a car with a camera. So w- what percentage of what you do is the kind of boots on the ground trying to find people versus more like insurance side investigation, more corporate stuff, maybe some government stuff? Like what, what percentage does that fall into? Yeah, I, I would say our field work is about half, half of all of our work. Um, and more than half of that is insurance fraud work, insurance defense work. Um, you know, when you get hurt at a big box store, really anywhere in the country, because uh, we work for a, a lot of the big box stores and big companies, um, if you get hurt, either if you're an employee or a customer, and the insurance company has reason through its algorithms to suspect that perhaps this person is not being truthful, we will follow that person usually over three or four days to see um, how they're behaving. Are they, um, uh, you know, are they really injured? And Normally, we will catch someone in the act, even if they are really hurt. People are stubborn and they're doing things that their doctors are telling them not to be doing. And that can also help our clients in cases. I had somebody on the podcast a week or two ago on the other side of this. He's a personal injury attorney, uh, Michael Mayer. He actually I saw I was dropping my kids off at school. He had a little banner out at the school as kids go to school uh, over with mine at Griffin Elementary. And we were talking a little bit about that. How he got into that was he had a. Uh, a situation with his wife, this was on the medical side, and they were basically denying coverage for her. She had cancer or something, and he had had a whole uh, crusade against the insurance company, and that kind of gave him the impetus to fight for the little guy and all that. So we talked a little bit about the other side of that. Uh, So it's it's interesting because, you you know, you you have to look at both sides, obviously, because there is a lot of fraud out there, and there's a lot of people gaming the system and trying to take advantage. And, you know, that's where you kind of fall. Yeah. I mean, if you're really hurt, you have nothing to fear. Uh, you have nothing, you know, there's, if you have nothing to hide, then you have nothing to fear from a private investigator following you for a few days. But uh, I, I would echo that sentiment that, and especially in Florida, I always say it's a sunny place for shady people. Uh, and we, we have caught people doing all kinds of things. Um, uh, you know, uh, someone came in for a medical appointment. They stayed at a hotel. We knew what hotel they were staying at. And he went to the gym that morning and did heavy weights and uh, lifting a barbell. And uh, we had a, a subject who had wrist, neck, and back injuries. And uh, we discovered through social media that she belonged to a bowling league. Uh, and we just, we didn't even have to follow her. We just set up camp at the bowling alley every, you know, once a, one night a week. And and for four weeks, videotaped her bowling. Uh, you know, so the, 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 that's just, it's just unbelievable. Yeah. Really making your job easy there. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. Uh, no, I mean, it's, it's, it's amazing how people will make these claims and then not even realize that people are going to look into it, right? Like, sure. Uh, and the insurance companies have every incentive to do it because uh, the amount of money they spend on us is, is a fraction of what they're going to save if we catch catch the subject doing something. Yeah, for yeah. sure. So, so go, let's go back a little bit. Um, I know you started your professional career uh, in government service, uh, working under uh, Senator Monaghan. Can you talk a little bit about what you did back then and like what that entails? Yeah. Yeah, and I, I think it's a great a great tale for for college students in particular. Um, I, I you know I grew up in Buffalo, New York. Uh, no political ties or connections from my you know from my family or government connections. Uh, I didn't. I that was an internship with Senator Moynihan, uh, and then my university SUNY Buffalo sent me to Washington D.C. as an intern. They had an internship program for a semester, and I went to the State Department. Uh, and from there, I met someone who went on to the White House, brought me back as as an intern for a summer, and then I got hired and stayed on for three years. And my, my boss, the deputy national security advisor, was appointment man for the White House for intelligence. So it's just natural for me to go to CIA after that. Natural. Uh, but it all started with internships and networking from from a very early age, and, and it grew from there. Who was at the time, who was the deputy national and security advisor that you worked under in the White House? That was General Carrick, who was a deputy for Sandy Berger. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. See, see, seems like a, a natural progression um, through your through your professional career. Uh, and, and so uh, <clears throat> when it comes to the CIA, I know there's uh, probably, you know, a lot of it's classified. And you don't want to talk about that as much. Is there anything you can share with us? Uh, on a limited scope, just to tease the listeners, if you will. Um, well, you know, we we uh, we had our uh, alumni weekend a few weeks ago. I spoke actually about my industry, private investigation, due diligence. Um, you know, they, 
you know, I, I don't know what I can say other than they do a lot of good work behind, you know, you, you hear a lot more about the failures than the, the, than the successes, of course. Uh, but there are a lot of Americans out there doing a lot of dangerous things to keep us safe. Yeah, for sure. For sure. So what do you like to do for fun when you're not working, Mark? Tell us a little about your family. Uh, yeah, well, I run a book club. Uh, and anyone is, uh, it's a virtual book club is on zoom. We meet every six weeks. We, uh, I had it many, many years ago and we started at the beginning of COVID and, uh, anyone is welcome to join. It's called Hurwitz book club. You can look it up on Facebook. Um, uh, otherwise I, I'm on the Peloton. Uh, I'm a bourbon certified bourbon steward. Uh, actually I was just in Nashville last week for work, but I got it to, got to enjoy some, some good bourbons. A certified bourbon steward. Yeah, and actually, we have the South Florida Whiskey Society down here that meets in Broward. Uh, usually, it's Dash, and that's that's. Uh, if anyone's interested in getting, getting more involved in whiskey and, and bourbon, that's a way to do it. And that's how I got my license, my my certification as well. Uh, very, very interesting. Yeah, and uh, and I'm very involved with a, a group called Entrepreneurs Organization (EO). Uh, I, I really view myself more as a entrepreneur that happens to be a private investigator than the other way around. Um, I, I have an amazing staff of uh, four case managers, uh, two community relations managers, um, a, uh, a, a special assistant, um, all, all of us working together as a team. Um, and it's, it's been really special and I feel very privileged to, to grow the business as I have, there are not many investigators that have a staff. Um, and I love being an entrepreneur and I love growing the business. And that's my real passion. Speaking of entrepreneur, being an entrepreneur, I'm curious, going back to the transition from public service uh, around 2008 into the private sector, what was one of the biggest, I, I guess, differences or challenges uh, yeah. from going from public service into uh, starting your own business and being an entrepreneur? Yeah, it's a really great question because uh, government doesn't really train you to uh, think and act like a business owner. Uh, and I didn't take any business classes in college. So I, I've made every mistake imaginable I, uh, at running and building a business. I, I have made it. Um, I've had to learn uh, how to outsource as much as I can any non-core function um, using um, the experts, the bookkeeper, the CPA, lawyer, um, SEO, uh, website. I, I don't think I, I'm not going to try to do something that I'm not an expert in. And that goes for even in our investigation field too. Um, leveraging technology has been really key to building the business. And I've had to learn that also the hard way, but having a CRM, a contact relationship management system from the beginning, when you start a business, I think is one of the most important things. Uh, keeping track of all your contacts, building your account, contact and client list, uh, being able to know who's hired you in the past, uh, who's just talked to you, um, being able to stay in touch with them via newsletters, uh, informing them, educating them in the newsletters, not just uh, promoting oneself. Um, using a reception service. So when someone calls me, the phone doesn't go to voicemail had that for a long, long time, being able to call out from my phone using a third party provider. So I can, I have a business phone number that I call out from that we can, our team can even text from, um, setting up locations in other parts of the state, getting the licenses, all of that. It's been, you know, the admin side to running and building a business is, is extremely heavy. Uh, I do, you know, I, I'm really not involved in cases. I'm running them, building the business and meeting new clients. Um, but it's, it's, it's you really have to like it. You really you really do, because it's it's a lot of work, a lot of hard work. Yeah, people people have people that don't you know that don't have their own business. They work for others. Um, you know, they they get the vision of what it would be like to own their own business and be their own boss. And it seems all glorious uh, until you get into it. And it is it, the re the upside is, is fantastic. But, you know, you, you got to do everything and you got to wear many hats and it's. Uh, takes a lot of hard work and perseverance and blood, sweat, and tears, uh, but it is that much more rewarding, you know, when you when you when you finally get there. So, Mark, sit, sitting here today, <clears throat> looking back through your journey, is there 
something that comes to mind, one thing in particular, maybe uh, some, some life hardship or challenge, something you struggled with tremendously, maybe like a defining moment um, that at the time seemed like it might've been the end of the world for you, but sitting here today, you can look back at that and, you know, say that you're thankful for having gone through that and it really shaped where you are today. You know, um, it, it, our clients, when our clients call us, they have a problem that needs to be fixed. And for them, it's the biggest problem in their universe, especially for example, a cheating spouse, um, to have the nerve to call an investigation agency. Uh, it takes, it, it takes a lot and they're calling an emotional state. So our clients have a lot writing on the work that we do. And I'm, we're always very careful. Uh, we don't want to disappoint our clients. Um, so when we do have a disappointed client, uh, when there are personnel problems, it leads to sleepless nights, you know, uh, it just, it just does, I, you know, none of us want to have to, uh, have an unhappy client an unhappy employee an unhappy ex employee, uh, and it happens, but I, I tell my staff often, and I have to tell this to myself often as well. I have been in life and death situations overseas for the, for the government. Um, and, and nothing that we do, thank God is life or death. Anything can be fixed. We can do more work. We can give money back. Uh, we can work things out, but everything has a solution. Everything can be fixed. Nothing is permanent. Uh, so I think that context helps uh, our staff and helps me on a daily basis to, to remember that. Yeah, for sure. <clears throat> never myself, never been in a, a life or death situation. Um, but that is, it, it is interesting to keep that in perspective because like you said, everybody has their, their, their days, everybody has struggles they go through. Um, and it's important to, um, keep that in context and realize that everything al always works out. It yeah, it does. Um, <clears throat> yeah. So for sure. What would be the one thing that you'd like for our listeners to know about your business, about Crossroads? You know, I, I, you asked before about the preconceived notion of a, a private investigator, a uh, guy in a car with a camera and how it's, you know, like a, a private dick. Um, We've spent some time about our our mission. What's the company's mission in society and life, and how do you know how do we relate to our clients? And I think it's providing information to our clients so they can make better informed decisions. Uh, so you know, I would say to the general public, uh, when you're not sure about something. Uh, you need to make a, a business decision, a family decision, a dating decision. Um, you know, if you need to rent out a property to a potential tenant, there are ways to get information to inform your decision. Um, and that's what we're here for. Uh, we want to help the good guys uh, with, with, with information. Uh, information is always on the side of good. So that, that's, that's what I would, you know, the message I would try to get out to society. Yeah. I was actually just talking to a previous guest about decision-making in general. Um, and, and what most people struggle with is when it comes time to make a big decision, I think people don't necessarily have a framework in place on how to effectively go about making decisions and they, 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 let, they let their emotions creep into it and it delays them from making decisions and they end up kicking the can down the road for weeks, months, sometimes years. And what I've realized on the other side of 40, now I'm 43, is that all the time that I've spent going back and forth, stewing over decisions, all the ban mental bandwidth that I've wasted, I would have been better served to just get the right information and make it make the best decision possible with the information I have. And then you learn from the results. Like you said, you know, it, nothing's, nothing's typically ever the end of the world. You make a good decision, great, you move on. You make a bad decision, you learn from it. And you move on from there. But I, I think it's great to, um, I mean, what you're doing on your end, obviously, to help with people that are dealing with 
um, really serious situations that could use professional advice uh, from the investigative standpoint. So, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I, I would add that people don't really, don't really know what our capabilities are. So uh, we always encourage people to call in or email in and explain the challenge, explain what would help you best in your case, in your life, in your situation. And then we can explain what capabilities that we have that match those requirements. All right. Now, I was connected with you initially. I, I met um, someone from your organization at the Davy Cooper City Chamber of Commerce meeting. Are you guys, where are you based out of? Where, where's your office? Uh, I mean, you're. Yeah, so uh, we are we're based in Miami. OK, uh, but we have uh, we have people in uh, all over the state, uh, employees or contractors. We, we have the state of Florida is saturated with the Crossroads Investigations presence. Uh, we have a, a known uh, and trusted network of agents around the country and even overseas that we've worked with over these past 15 years. We know who to use, who not to use. Um, you know, when when you're in uh, uh, Romania, and you need to find information about a company in, in Florida. You don't really know to go to Sunbiz. You don't know to check fictitious names. You know, people in Florida don't know how to, to check the fictitious names in Sunbiz. Uh, so we use people on the ground in every, you know, every country overseas, even in other states. Those are the people who are going to know how to get the best information. And we manage all of that for our clients. Okay. How can our listeners learn more how can we reach you maybe share your website your contact yeah. information let us know how we can find you mark our website is x the letter x investigations with an s at the end.com so x investigations.com our email is info at x investigations.com all of our contact information is on the website you can fill in a form right there uh, we are super responsive it's one of our core values uh, you will hear back from us uh, immediately and uh, we are at everyone's service all right. Sounds good. And we will, of course, link in the description below to all of your contact information. Mark, thanks so much for joining us today, brother. Thanks so much for having me, Jeremy. I really appreciate it. Yeah, it's our pleasure. And thanks to our listeners for tuning in. And we will catch you next time. Everyone have a wonderful day and take care. Thanks for listening to. Thanks for listening to the Good Neighbor Podcast, Cooper City. To nominate your favorite local business to be featured on the show, go to gntcoopercity.com. That's gntcoopercity.com or call 954-231-3170.